All right, welcome to the Canadian Thanksgiving Day and on Creds Working Group meeting, October 10th, 20, October 14th, 24, 2024. Um, we are recording the call. It is a Linux Foundation decentralized trust meeting. The Linux Foundation antitrust policy is in effect, as is the Linux Foundation decentralized trust code of conduct. Um, just a couple of things to talk about. We're going to go through the replication manager for Elsor and talk about some adjustments that might <laughs> happen. We'll see, um, depending on progress and what we want to do. And then um, talk a bit about this performance report that came out, which I can now drop this. Plus, um, had a talk or had a brief exchange with the um, author of that, and he's agreed that he should drop the plus off of the BBS um, title for that. And he did. So there you go. Okay. Um, revocation manager. So let me start with my understanding of this. We started with this understanding of um, the revocation manager and the interaction. So you would have an independent issuer that would um, request creation of a rev reg from a revocation manager and would get back from that an identifier and an accumulator and a, and a timestamp for that accumulator from the revocation manager. And, the, and in order to create the revocation manager, there has to be a secret key that is managed. And then um, the issuer would inform the revocation manager when credentials elements were revoked so that a state of the registry could be maintained. And at at a, at some at that point, a another accumulator and a timestamp would be returned, and the issuer would publish that accumulator and timestamp. Now and then, so now we have a way to create a registry. We have a way to update the registry when revocations occur. And then the holder, when when the issuer issues them a credential, they would issue them a credential with a revocation registry element, a, um, I guess in a, a, they would also be able to get the accumulator and the timestamp. They would also get a witness associated with that accumulator and timestamp. Now, what I didn't understand was this step, which is the holder periodically, when, when they need to present something, goes and requests an update of their witness for a given accumulator, um, given their past witness and get that from the revocation manager and the revocation manager would use the information they had namely the set of elements that have been revoked now my understanding was and i believe i'm wrong and so that's the first check is that the revocation manager to update the witness needed to know the secret but it doesn't need to know the secret correct Correct. <clears throat> okay. So what that leaves the possibility... When you mean secret, you mean secret key or the element? Exactly, the secret key. Yes, that's true. And so what that leaves the possibility of, and I should have drawn this and I apologize, and we could maybe do it on the fly because I'm pretty good at um, UML for this, but... What that leaves the opportunity for is that this, these two arrows, the revocation manager could be split based on these two arrows and this arrow. So the rev one function would be to create the revocation, return the accumulator, and that can can safely be done, if you will, safely being in a privacy preserving way without MPC. And it doesn't need MPC. Um, so 
these set of functions could be done there. And then as long as the revocation manager could get a hold of the elements and um, the accumulator, so all of the public information that gets published, the, the, the public information being the data that get published on the ledger plus the list of revoked elements, um, this task could be done in an MPC manner independent of this, this other task. Does that make sense? So I must not be explaining myself clearly because like to me, I was always saying the update witness doesn't require the secret. Yeah, show, yeah, no. At all, it, it, and it doesn't require yeah. MPC at all because the nodes don't even have to talk to each other to do it. Yeah. The only part that requires MPC is revocation and the key generation. That's it. Those are the only two operations that do. Hold on. So the, uh, those two words you just used, revocation being what? You're removing elements from the accumulator. Okay. Why does that require MPC? Sorry. Um, Sorry, that requires MPC. Okay, the only reason it would require MPC is if you have the secret key distributed among a bunch of nodes. If okay. Not, if it's not distributed, then there's no MPC. Okay, but... But the value of MPC to me is it allows a holder to shard out its witness so nobody knows who is asking for a, an update amongst a bunch of revocation managers. That's, uh, the uh, that's one benefit, but the real benefit of MPC is that the secret key is distributed among, or it's decentralized, right? Among a different set of nodes. So you can't just compromise one, one node and get the whole key. That's the true value of MPC. The other part that you're talking about is the privacy, which is yes. the user can split up their shares and ask for an update. Yes. That, that really doesn't require MPC at all. MPC is like where the parties have to talk to each other over at least two to three rounds yeah. to finally compute something, but that's not the case when they're updating their witness. The only thing they have to do is split into shares, send it to various nodes, and those nodes just return a result. They don't even have to talk to each other. Okay. So so the benefit of doing it on this side of the revocation manager is the um, security. The benefit of doing it on this side is the privacy. Correct. Yep. You okay. It. And let me confirm, elements are... How how large is each element? 32 bytes. 32 bytes. So now the size we can of shortcut the, this. Yeah. You could shortcut this, Stephen, and just do UUIDs and then they then you convert them to elements on the fly if you want to really compress data. So what I did in the anon creds library. Tell me about that. My, Tell me about that. So if you look in the non creds library for like my test examples, <clears throat> I'm just using UUIDs. Okay. So what does that get you? How big is that? How big is a UUID? Those are just 128 bits or 16 bytes. 16 bytes. I mean, Versus... it can really be anything you want because all I'm doing is when I go to do the proof, I just convert it to the value that is actually okay. in the computer. It's okay. it just hashes it under the hood. So it doesn't matter what you put in there. I just wanted it big enough that it's unique, but small enough I don't have to store a ton of data. So 16 bytes is more than enough. But yeah, if you want to just say, all right, I'm just going to store the raw value that goes in there, that's 32 bytes. 16. So that'd be... So if you have a fully revoked 1 million credential registry, that would be 15 million, or sorry, 15 megabytes. Oh, you, okay. Megabytes. So you're talking 16 bytes per value, and it, yeah. all, of, all million of them are revoked. Yeah, you'd have 16 megabytes. Yeah, 16 megabytes, yeah. 
which is not an outrageous size, especially for a revocation manager. Nope. It's not bad at all. So, okay. So there's the trade-off that that that's what I didn't understand is, is the purpose. And I was, I was focused. I'm definitely focused on this side, which is the privacy. Yeah. So if you just want the revocation manager and the issuer to be the same party, yeah, then there's no MPC at all. Exactly. And well, there's MPC for privacy, as I say. It's just well, again yeah, back it's to It's not that true purpose. MPC, but um well, and the thing is you can still do the privacy part, even if there's only one party. Here's how you do oh, it. Oh, wait a sec. The holder could do that. If it's 16 megabytes, they're downloading, the holder could do that. No, no, hang on. They're not downloading 16 megabytes every time they update. They're only downloading the changes since they last updated. Sure, sure. That's like worst case scenario. They never updated. Maybe they went offline for an entire year. Now yeah. they have to download everything. Yeah, that would be worst case. But again, yeah. the way around that is the holder just creates a number of shares and then just hits the issuer, say, seven out of 10 times. Yeah, yeah. Or he hits it 10 times, randomly drops three, yeah, and then does the update and he's done. So yeah. That's why I mean you can still do the privacy part, even if there's just one party. You yeah. just keep sending yeah. different shares to the same party. They're just gonna do the same computation just with a different share. Okay. Fascinating. Okay, I'm confused. Um uh, so the yeah. up update witness doesn't require MPC, does it? No. Okay. Uh, but 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 the rev revocation does. And in order to in order for our revocation to use MPC, we have to first distribute the keys, which is part of the create revocation registry, right? Yes. And if you want, I can walk you through the code to do key setup. No worries. I'm looking at the uh, the Tenaro DKG path, but but I do have a question. So 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 we are we are setting up this distributed system. How, how do different nodes talk to each other through API calls again? Well, so that's the thing. The cryptographic library I wrote, make sure you're using the 1.0.0 branch, not, yeah. not main. Um, it's a lot easier and simpler. But you can we can design that however we want. Do we want gRPC? Do we want REST calls? It doesn't matter. The reason I didn't design that in directly into the protocol is because different networks have different needs. Like Lit uses gRPC, but initially they were using REST. But the cryptographic protocol is agnostic to the transport layer, however you do that. Yeah, you're talking about RESTful API, right? Well, they do. So initially, yeah, they were doing REST calls. Uh -huh. um, so when the network is up, like I'm just going to tell you how Lit does it. So Lit has like one centralized read-only place, um, like say on an Ethereum smart contract that says, these are the current nodes. That's all it does. And then the nodes go, okay, now we know each other's IP addresses and peer IDs. And then the current protocol, at least, well, the first protocol was over REST. So then they would just send requests to each other over REST to do the, to do the Gennaro DKG. Then we found out later on that it was just taking too long to do it over REST. So we switched to gRPC and it's about 15 times faster. So that's what we're using now. I'm sorry, but, I didn't hear that gRPC can can what is that exactly? gRPC? Yeah. Um so so it it's Google's kind of a <laughs> version of RPC. RPC and so what they do is they encode everything as protocol buffs. That's like a very packed encoding. It's binary. You can think of it similar to like Cbor or Bear or some of these other binary encodings. Message Pack is another one. Uh -huh. um, and it talks, it's like a long lived connection between the nodes. Whereas, you know, REST, you hit it, it, it sets up the connection, sends the data, returns the response, and then tears down the connection. Uh, gRPC, they're long lived. So they're like up for however long you want. You can say one directional or bi-directional. So in our case, we're just we just set them up as long-lived bi-directional. So they're up. 
And under the hood, it's using TLS to do you know, all the encryption stuff, but it's not throwing away the key every time and it doesn't have to set up and tear down connections every time. So instead of doing a text format like JSON, it does protocol buffs. I So see, I see. for protocol buffers, there's all sorts of different ways you could pack messages to make them smaller, but that's the idea. So then the nodes just talk to each other. So Gennaro is pretty easy because it's just five rounds of broadcasting to each other. Right, yes. And the last one is purely just a check. So you could even skip it if you, if you don't want to. Uh, yep, I see. So purely for proof reasons. So you get like a, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, what's the term? <laughs> Why can I not think? Um, yeah, it's purely for uh, CCA security is what it is. uh, could you could you spell the jar PC or PC? Um, hey, uh, Stephen, do you mind if I share my screen? Sure. Somewhere, somehow, I'll do it. <laughs> All right, hold on. I've got three desktops here. i got to figure out which one I want. <laughs> mm, yeah, there we go. That's the one. Okay, so, so like, it's GRPC, like that. Oh, GRPC. Okay. So there's that one. So then if we go look at... Um, And this is the one that's been audited. It's uh, I've got it in a release candidate. So let's go to this one. You'll see there's like various rounds, but all you're doing is you're creating um, a secret participant or a refresh if you're doing proactive secret sharing. But anyway, all you really care about is this. Um, and pretty much all you're doing is calling, uh, where is it, run? Yeah, you're calling run and receive, and that's it. So if we go look at like the tests, let me go to the repo. It might be a little easier to read. Let's see. So if I go tests, happy path, yay. Notice it works with any curve because Gennaro is curve agnostic. It doesn't care. Um, here's a bunch of different tests where it will like, see, it starts with five and then adds one in case of node, go, or, you know, you want to grow the network, it, you can do add and remove and all sorts of things, but, um, probably the easiest one. I'll see if I can find it. Uh, I'm trying to remember all the tests I wrote. <laughs> I had to write a bunch just to make sure it was working. Uh, I mean, here's probably an easy one, right? Is just this this one. So initialize with five, right? So it says, here's my threshold, which I set to three. Limit is basically the total number of participants you want. Yep. And then this is saying, I want the numbering to just be sequential. In our in our case, they're actually static peer IDs, but yep. just for test purposes, you can make them sequential. Um, so anyway, then I just, setting up the parameters, which you can see is mostly just defaults, which is pretty easy. And then you say, all right, next round, receive next round, run the next round, receive the next round. Just repeat until all the rounds are done. The output is a, is a public key and a secret share for each participant. That's it. So do, do the nodes actually send messages during like in the next round function, right? No, next round is when they're they've received all their messages so they can run the next round locally. So if you go into that, you'll notice it says participant run. Okay. If we step into that, it's you're gonna see um where is it? <laughs> all right, I know where it is. So how how does uh notes send messages to each other? Well, so all right, let me go back. Sorry. <laughs> so the output of this is uh is a round generator. So if if I scroll up to where that's called, this round generator. So let's go into receive. It's not exactly like this, but basically the round generator says this is who you're supposed to send the data to, right here. Mm -hmm. This is the like. Oh, this oh, is purely oh. for convenience is the ordinal. Like, hey, are they at index zero, one, two, three, or four? Here's their peer ID. This is who you're supposed to send it to, and here's the data you're supposed to send. 
However you send it is up to you. But since this is a test, there's no network, right? So I just say, all right, just, just send it. And then when they get it on the other side, you just call receive on the data only. And that's it. I see, I see. And So once it and once it's got enough, like if you try to call run and it hasn't received enough data, it'll just return an error saying, I don't have enough data to go to the next round yet. I have to have at least a threshold of responses to proceed. Yeah, right, So right. let's say you start with 10, but then only seven finish. Like that's fine as long as it's above the threshold. The protocol Yeah. still works. But in the ideal world, <laughs> At least for the initial DKG, you want all of them to finish. Because otherwise, like, let's say you said the six of 10, but only seven finish. Then you've got six of seven, not six of 10. So it's not quite as good. But it is robust against, like, failures in the sense that as long as the thresholds still finish and continue, then you're still okay. Now, you what you could do is say, all right, we're going to start with 10. Four accidentally dropped off. So now we're at six of six. But then we can slowly add those ones back in later. Um, there's code that shows how to do that in here. Um, Right, yes, I saw D, that. not add decrease. I don't want to do that. Uh, no, not remove either. Uh, add participant, right? So I do five, but then I want to increase it by two and add two more, right? So here's the previous list of participants, and then here's the two new ones. I'm going to do it sequentially, um, but lit, of course, hard codes this, so they're all of this type, but that's fine. And then you'll see, like, hey, if they... existed before they're going to do this with their existing secret and then if they're being added they're going to do this because you can't change the underlying secret you don't want that to change but you do want the shares to change so anyway that's how that's how the genaro works so when you call run um it returns this round output generator And, and in this test case, I'm just grabbing them all at once for all the participants. But since if you're on an individual node, you're only going to get one of these because you don't have all of them. And then it, you're just going to, it'll say, um, like, if you look at uh, here, it says, all right, this is just an iterator. And this says, this is who you're supposed to send it to, ordinality, if that's how you want to do it, or by peer ID. And here's the data you send. However you send it is up to you. However you receive it is up to you. Once it gets to the other side, just call receive and this will process it. So um, each node only have to call the next round to generate the uh, the round generator and the uh, Now the you're going to call this. Well, without the unwrap, of course. So For I test don't purposes, have to call I wrote it. next round because I'm doing it for all of them because there's Oh, not. oh, oh, I see. You're only going to call this because you don't have all the participants. You only have one. When you're on one node, you only have one participant. Right, makes sense. You're going to get a generator. And then what you're going to do is you're going to loop over it like this and say send. <laughs> and on the other side, they're going to say receive. Yep, yeah, that So makes you can just sense. do a loop that says, all right, just receive, 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 receive. And then there are methods on. It to say how many how many have I received, <laughs> and then Wait, in in an one. MPC call, in an MPC call, does does each node send messages to each other, or each node just send the message to to a random node? No, they don't send it to random nodes. This tells you what you need, where you need to send it. Oh, I see, I see. Okay. So you don't have to worry about is this a peer data where you only send it to one, or is this broadcast where I send to everybody? I've I handle that behind the scenes. So I basically say, this is what you have to send to that particular peer. Just send it to them. Because in reality, you're not going to have a huge broadcast channel where you're connected to all the nodes simultaneously. That's too hard to manage and too hard to set up. Okay. So Okay. the easiest thing to do is I say, all right, here, send, send this peer this ID. And then you'd say, all right, send. And then... The next iterator will go, all right, now here's the next one. Here's the next one. Here's the next one until this runs out. And then you've sent all your data. And then you go down to and just say, all right, I'm going to wait to receive as much as I can until maybe some timeout happens. Like maybe you give them, I don't know, 20 seconds to send to get all your messages back. And then you try to call run. And if, and if run fails, it's because you either got bad data or you didn't get enough of them. So that's it. I see. Um, I have another question regarding the implementation. So which part should be actually done in Python or should they both all be in, uh, in Rust?
What part should be done in Python? The calling of these methods. So I have these five methods. Uh, You can send the messages back and forth in Python however you want. Because okay, okay. all this is is just a binary blob. Here's a number. Here's a peer ID, which um, depending on whatever system you're using, could be a big number, small number, whatever you want. Um, if I remember right. Uh, okay, come on. Give me... No, <laughs> it's not taking me where I want it to go. It's in here. No, not rounds. Trying to skip through it. Where is it? Yeah, so this is a scalar. So depending on the curve, it's, you know, the full light. It's like a full 32 bytes at least. Sometimes bigger. Depends on how you want to address it or if you just want to go by number. That's what this is. Okay, yeah. And then you'll see the data sent is just is just bytes. Bytes, yeah. Because you, you shouldn't care what this is. This is specific to the protocol, so don't try to tamper with it. <laughs> you do, it'll, it'll say, oh, I got bad data. So I'll still have two FFI functions for, for, for the receive and run, right? Yep, that's it. Okay, that makes sense. Well, for what, but you also need to create the participant, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, right. And so to create a participant, you have to define the parameters, which for the most part, you can just ignore these two. Um, you won't need those. Uh, probably the easiest thing to do then is just call new. These you could just set to none. And if you wanted, you could just set this to none as well for simplicity reasons. And then all you have to do is tell me what's the threshold and how many participants there are. That's it. Okay, okay. That's it. Yeah. That's the easiest part of MPC. <laughs> That's why I said that one's already done. The the part of deleting and removing elements, that one's a little more complicated. Right. But I've got the beaver triple generation done, which is the hardest part. But it's going to be similar. Basically, you tell me the... I'm giving you the data and you send it however you want. Mm -hmm. Okay, that clears things up. Thanks. Okay. Uh, and then see Stephen. Uh, Stephen, last week you yeah. mentioned. Uh, last week you mentioned that we don't need. Uh, don't need don't need MPC, but we still need right. So, so now I'm, well. From and here's my the other report for you and for both Stevens. <laughs> here's your nice from, audit report. Oh. Uh, so yes, it was audited. Oh, good. Included. So everything you see in there is audited. So anyway, so it's like minor. They're like, oh, you didn't have a security policy defined. I'm like, oh my gosh, really? You're gonna flag that? <laughs> All right, fine, whatever. Okay, so the issue here is so that focus and that conversation you just had was about key security. Mm -hmm. And what I my focus is on privacy, which is why we're we're getting to this point. Um, to me, the more interesting question is how can the holder be private? Given that yeah, that's that's what I worry about. So let me ask a few questions about the other side of it, Mike. Let's let's talk about the witness update. Okay. So the witness data can be as small as 16 megabytes for a million credentials. If it's revoked. How long, how long does it take? Suppose you hadn't cached anything, so you retrieved all 16 megabytes. And how long would it take to generate a witness from that on a smartphone? Um so Let's see. When I was working with Sam Jacques, if we did it all as one big blob, it took yeah. a long time, like even on a desktop machine, but we figured out a way to break it up into chunks, like to process it in chunks. Yeah. So, you'd, so what, what I mean is you would still download all the data at once, but then yeah. you just process it in chunks and it went a lot faster. I think we were able to do it in just a few, like 
I don't think I ever did 16 megabytes. I think the most I ever did was, uh, well, actually, maybe I did. Because I have a test where I basically say, add 10,000, remove 600. Add 10,000, or add 1,000, remove 600. Repeat Mm -hmm. that, and that represents a day. And then we repeated it for a year. So 365 days, so there's that many changes. Yeah. And if you process it, like I just said, like you just do little small batches, it was done within like about 1.5 seconds on my desktop. So on a smartphone, probably twice that. So maybe about three seconds, Three seconds. which is still reasonable, but probably not desirable. Yeah. But that's the extreme case. That is the extreme case, correct. Yeah. So you've got, and, and just a matter of interest, um, when you count, when yours has been revoked, the result is zero, right? Or something obvious. Uh, yeah, when yours is revoked, it, the, basically the update function does the equivalent of try to divide by zero. Yeah. Okay. And then it goes, So, I can't divide by zero. <laughs> that gives you an invalid value. yeah. So. So there's no need to go first check to see if yours is invalid because that would just take more time. So you don't even need to do that because you just Nope. do the calculation. And if it, if it errors off, Then you if revoke. you get an exception, you know, yours is revoked. That's right. Okay, good. And so I'm thinking of the, The case of, I'm, I'm trying to go through practical cases. So if you think about um, a driver's license, for example, eventually, if you relied on revocation for um, a driver's license, you would eventually have all of them revoked. But if you used expiration, put an expiry date on every credential you would actually have relatively few revocations therefore the the actual size of the revocation registry would be small Yeah, so if you're doing both, you're basically saying if it's expired, then there's no reason to check if it's not revoked. exactly Well, you're still going to do both checks, yes but, oh yeah 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 sorry you're but not you're going revoked to do both would checks still pass, but but expired would fail. exactly That's cool. Yeah. yeah Yep. Yeah, you can And do both. and in theory, if if you didn't do deltas, you could do unrevokes as well, correct? If you... So if you always got the full list of revoked credentials associated with every accumulator, in other words, you didn't ever use deltas, you always just gave the full state. Um, it doesn't work like that because what the deltas do is are basically like computations done by um, whoever holds the pri the re revocation key, the secret key. Right. It's like a pre-computed computation on the actual data plus the private key. It's like pre-computed stuff. Right. But if you always publish the state being here is all of the elements that have been revoked and here's the accumulator, if you totally changed which ones were revoked and unrevoked some, you just get a new state, wouldn't you? No, it doesn't work that way. How come? How could it not? <laughs> because there might be a... So, if you get... You're saying, basically, if I take the latest accumulator and I have every value that's been revoked from it... I, what I'm saying is every time I produce an accumulator, I also provide the full state of the full list of every revoked credential that contributes to that accumulator. Yeah. So how would you create a new witness from that? So and then I use that to create a witness. Don't I don't I don't I create a witness by by. taking the list of revoked elements and processing it to, uh, along with my own element to create a witness. Well, you don't use your witness or your element at all to create a witness. Remember, under the hood, it's represented as the accumulator without your value in it. Right. But, I, but in other words, The problem is you don't know all the values that are in it. You'd have to know those too.
Yeah, I know. That's what I'm saying is you, you'd know all the elements in it and, and removed. Oh, oh, in it and removed. You have to know both. Okay, so you can only revoke things. You can't unrevoke things. Oh, you could unrevoke. Yes, we could unrevoke if you want. That's unrevoking is is yes, you can unrevoke. Okay. So if I always provide with every accumulator the full list of all revoked elements. So if this so if there was a chunk of data that the issuer published that says here's the accumulator, here's the timestamp and here's the list of of all UUIDs of revoked credentials. And the holder grabbed that, it could calculate its own witness, just like an on credits does today. No, it can't do it oh. unless you know everything in it and removed. You'd have to have every element ever issued. You're going back to the old way. <laughs> okay, so you can't do that. So hold on then. What does the revocation... You're basically wanting a tails file. If you go back to a tails file, then yes, you could, but we don't I want thought to it was, uh, sorry, what I thought we were doing here was you're, it's like a tails file, but it's only the, unre it's only the revoked ones. No, 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 no. So what, how it works is the only thing you actually ever need to publish are the, are the deltas. A delta is like specific, it's like data that's, that's pre-computed by the revocation manager. Oh, I see. So it's not elements, it's deltas. It's deltas, yes. Okay. So basically what the revocation manager does is he takes the current accumulator, the values he's going to remove, and does a computation. Ah, okay. The computation results in two outputs. The first is yep. the new accumulator. The second are the deltas. And he how big is the deltas? Uh, well, it depends on how many values were removed. It's it's like logarithmic. So if I, let's say I remove 100, then I get 10 deltas. And how big are it, how big is a delta? 48 bytes. So they're not very big. And it's the ratio is it's it's is it's about it's about log 10, right? It's not exactly that, but it's close. So, so if, if I remove a thousand elements, I get maybe a hundred deltas. Roughly. So if I have a million credentials, but it but it depends on how often I revoke as well. Um no, the deltas only care about going from step A to step B. Okay. Now getting to your point, if I haven't updated, like I got a, an accumulator at step one and now it's at step 25, I have to grab all the deltas from in between. Right. And that's what I'm assuming is, and that's what I, when I say full state. So if the holder were to do it with no cash, they would always have to get all deltas. Yes. Okay. So that is one way to do it. That is the most expensive way to do it for the holder. Okay. So if you and read back long... on Sam Jacques' email, that's what he said. There's three different ways to do this, right? Yeah. Yeah. One has no privacy. One has full privacy, but is super expensive for the it, for the holder. Mm -hmm. The third is the option we came up with, which is a compromise of both. You get full privacy without doing too much hard computation. Yeah. So, what is the hard computation? Like, are we talking seconds, minutes? That's the part where we uh, I talked about where we batched it. Mm -hmm. It was about one and a half seconds on the desktop for a full year's worth of updates. And that's okay. assuming once you've already downloaded it. Yeah. And that's a daily, full year of daily? Yeah. So like what we did is we simulated, all right, in the German DMV, mm -hmm. on average, they add a thousand new driver's licenses per day and revoke 600. Okay. Either the, they didn't say what that means, whether they actually are like bad drivers or they're just expired. They didn't really say. And what's their really total like, population? Uh, Germany, it's like 80, 80, 90 million, I think. Right. Okay. Let's see. Yeah, 84 million. Okay. 
So that was the average. They didn't, yeah, like I said, they didn't distinguish what it means by revoked, whether it yeah. was just inspired or they were bad drivers, right? The, or bad data. Maybe they issued the driver's license and spelled something wrong, you know? Yeah. They, yeah. they didn't really say. Well, it could be address changes. I think that's probably yeah. the biggest. Yeah. I mean, that could be something else too, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So maybe it was data updates, whether it was bad data or data changed. So there's there's multiple ways data or the license could have been revoked. Who knows why? But so we said, yeah, all right, yeah. let's do 365 days of deltas where we add 1,000 and remove 600. Mm -hmm. and, and in doing that. But that was also back when we were adding deltas for ads. Because we wanted to see oh. what is the absolute worst case. So, because ads and removes were changing the accumulator, but then we said, "Oh, well, let's make it so we only have to change the accumulator on removes." Okay. So it actually shrink it. Yeah. And log to the ten would be sixty. Of six hundred would be sixty. Yeah. Times forty-eight bytes. Yep. Okay. So roughly, yeah, about two kilobytes, three kilobytes. So not terrible. Day. Yeah. So if you had an entire year that you collected and processed that on the fly, it would be that big. Yeah. So if I do that, well, hang on. I'm so that's there. under a meg. Yeah, it is. Well, it's. Yeah, barely under a meg, but yes. <laughs> so it's not bad. No, no, that's what I'm thinking. Because the biggest thing we need, the biggest problem we have is, is the privacy nature. There is no, like, there. everyone's doing all this work for BBS, BBS, I mean, signatures. And, and the rest of this. And th the issue is you don't have a revocation scheme. Correct. If, if we can do a revocation scheme that has unlinkability, th that's why I'm saying this holder problem is, is my bigger concern. I'm way less concerned on the MPC on this side. And I know that's what lit... And and what you're talking about is is important, but it's not to the correct. It's, well, it's that's so because lit is focused on privacy. Key. Exactly, exactly. And what I'm saying is where where the verifiable credentials and BBS needs to be is this side, which is holder privacy. And obviously, the yep. best holder privacy is if the holder can just do the calculation itself. Correct. Yeah. So. What are the attributes that get us to that? And 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 there's and obviously as as Jacques email or Sam's I, I keep going the other way with his name. Sam's email said, Sam Jacques email said neighbor to the north. There you go. <laughs> the holder could do the whole thing, or yep. we could go to a sharding where we have a bunch of revocation managers. A bunch of sharding with a bunch of revocation managers is very expensive. In in that you've got to coordinate everything, you've got to have a bunch of nodes and so on. If the holder could do it all themselves, that would be phenomenal. Wait, wait, wait. what do you mean sharding? Well, as I understand, you could have a bunch of of update managers. Let's not call them revocation managers. Update managers that collects the information necessary and the holder shards their their the information to each of those and collects up the results and and puts together their new witness right yeah the, well so here's here's what there. i would actually propose then instead of revocation managers you could say like i don't know what what's the good term but basically they can just cache all of the change sets exactly right? yes Yes. And that's all they do is because then they don't even have to talk to each other. There's no MPC at exactly. all. Yeah, that's what. Oh, OK. So no MPC. There's simply 
yeah, you're right. There's no MPC. All there is is just a holder requesting date updates from a bunch of update managers. Yes. Update and managers and getting in. getting back a partial result that they assemble into a final result. So it's not really MPC at all. It kind of is in that they shard their the input, send different shards to different people, and then get assemble the the results. Uh, Correct. Uh huh. Okay. Yes. As I say that that to me is what I'm after. And I thought we had to do the whole thing to be able to do that. And and that's my mistake, clearly. Oh, yeah, okay. So I apologize if I wasn't clear. Yeah, they're basically, it's kind of like an a la carte. You can pick and choose what works for you. Exactly. And, and what I'm saying is the most important thing for a, uh, for a revoc, like that would, that would blow open the possibilities of this is, is if we can do this side of it, either by the holder doing it all themselves because because we can define we can we can define the use cases that are appropriate or by having the holder simply where the use cases don't allow it the holder can we can have a bunch of update managers yep update generators we call them yeah update generators would be fine all they're doing is just offloading the computation okay right? Okay. They can't cheat. Like, even if they collaborated, they could try, like, so even if they collaborated, right? Yeah. Um, they couldn't reconstruct your secret. <laughs> yeah. And not only that, but you could even have one update. Sure. And and the holder, if, if their submissions could be suitably um, obfuscated. <laughs> oh, yeah. In other words, the holder passes it to some to the verifier and the verifier just sends in the things and sends them back you know if they could be obfuscated you don't even need a, a network of them a, a, a set of them you only need one even you only need one yep yeah yeah okay basically what the holder could do to try and like obfuscate it even further is just send them random shares yeah they random shares they could just be random values yep compute it on this and all the holder's gonna do is throw it away yeah <laughs> Here's I do the computation and send it back. Well, okay. so what you could do is like I'm just throwing out an example. They yeah. take their share, they split it into ten, or if, let's say they do something simple like three of five, but then they send five garbage shares and then the five real shares. Yeah, the update manager won't know the difference. Yeah, but the holder does because then he'll mm -hmm. get a result back and go, okay, I can throw away these five garbage ones. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, I could even throw away two of the even valid ones at yeah. random. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the update manager doesn't know the difference. That way, I can just avoid him trying to cheat or corrupt me. And then I check the I apply the updates and check my witness if it's valid. Then great. If not, then I know something went wrong with the update manager. In fact, I'll just download the data and do it myself at that point yeah. as a backup. Yeah. So. Okay. Now. Having said all this, I've got some homework because I want to write this up. And and that's independent. What where I'm wondering is where does that leave Victor? <laughs> Victor, um, whatever you're working on, you just need to. You, I'm not asking you to, to change anything, but um, wh what are the from that discussion? I don't think that has much influence on what I'm doing, right, Mike? Okay. No. Okay. Good. I mean, as long as you're publishing the updates, Victor, that's probably the big thing. Is the is the change sets? What do you mean the updates? So remember when you revoke, there uh -huh. should be two values that come back: the updated accumulator yep. and the change okay. set and the deltas. Yeah. If you're already Maybe. returning that, then you're done. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, then it doesn't have much influence. Okay, I'm going to try to write down some notes on the privacy nature of this. And um, might get, see if we can do some calculations on on different scenarios, you know, similar to what you did before, Mike. 
Yeah. Yeah. That's easy. And then, and then we can look at what we can take to IIW or something like that to say, what if we did this? Yeah. And so like the worst case scenario, you go offline for a year, for example. Yeah, exactly. You've never done, you've never updated your witness. You have something. So you have to get every, everything that's ever been produced for some valid use case. And, th and that's where I want to go is not that, that the issuer has to design their revocation in a way that works. Use expiry. Um, so you don't have to revoke when you expire. Stuff like that. Yeah. Because if you just make the assumption, oh, you're going to have to revoke every credential and every at some point. Well, that's uh, that's the worst case scenario for this, for uh, the worst use case for this um, mechanism. But as long as you avoid those, um, it sounds like we can make this very efficient or, right. or sufficiently efficient. Right. Yeah. So the only time you ever revoke is because there's data change or malicious. Exactly. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. You don't rope, revoke for revocation purposes. Okay. Excellent. Super interesting. Um, back to my forever question, Mike. Any any chance? Um, so this the BBS just keeps gaining momentum as the valid way to do this. There to me, it's coming down to there's two ways. Um to handle credentials that it's going to come down to practically, which is either BBS gains sufficient support or uh, the non-ZKP batch issuance is done. And right now, from what I can tell, the only difference between those two is that the issuer knows all. So if the issuer collaborates with the verifier they they know everything right and there's no, and there doesn't appear to be a way around that um obviously with batch with, issuance with or... batch issuance yeah yes because batch issuance can do revocation um how because every every credential you use is uniquely identified but you only use it once right so when yeah it's so a one and done Type exactly. Model. Yeah, that's what batch issuance is. One that's and done. not revocation. <laughs> well, it, it, true, but but you can say, oh, I need to revoke this credential. So you you have revoked the hundred copies of them, and you just use a bit uh, a status list, and you're done. Mm -hmm. So it is all doable, but the only thing is, as I say, the issuer knows all. Yeah. Um, and, I'm not and a fan of that model, but no, but and you have the complexity of you have to make sure the holder knows about one and done, and the issuer knows about issuing a hundred. But that's basically what people are doing. Um, BBS. That's the only thing they know. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. BBS has the capability to get there, and and BBS is where the momentum is going. Um, but. But as I say, revocation is not resolved. And that's where this privacy preserving revocation comes in. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So as far as where I'm at, like I said, you saw the Gennaro is in pre-release yeah. mode. Same with um, the verifiable secret sharing. I am. Yeah. Let's see. Next week is when I plan to publish those to Agora. Okay. And then done with those. And then I can add the P the BBS to Agora as that well, awesome. and that'll be in there. And then you'll also see the PR for the, you know, for the non-creds too, where you can hot swap the two. Okay, that's what I'm looking for. Okay, awesome. The main reason I still want PS signatures is because they're better for MPC. And if we get to post quantum, <laughs> yes. is that, do you think that's got legs that PS post quantum? uh oliver sanders does okay He's working real hard i mean yep his that's most why recent... i want to see it there is that well i mean the whole flexibility of it but bbs is getting momentum but it doesn't have a post-quantum answer right 
oh, of course not. And yeah. so that's why I'm like, so, you know, that's why, I mean, the fact that the post-quantum version got accepted to EuroCrypt, yeah. that's a very powerful statement. Okay, okay. And he's Excellent. working on shrinking it. Like like I said, his his last iteration was a nine megabyte private key and an eight megabyte yeah. public key. Yeah. He's like, I think I can get it down to at least half. And I'm like, well, good, because it needs to be a lot smaller. So, but anyway, um, I think it'll get there. Yeah. And uh, but this this is the cool thing is we can say, you know, you just hot swap the signature. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And away you go. So anyway, and excellent. Tim Jock and I are working on the post-quantum version of Allosaur. Yeah, so exactly. Works very similar. You just hot swap it out, and then you're and then you're good to go. So, all right, cool. all right, thanks. Um, IAW is coming up at the end of the month. If whatever progress, I'd like to report on it. All right. Do you want me to do a test then? Well, let like, me let me put together some notes, and 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 we'll we'll go back and forth on Discord. Okay, sounds good. That's awesome. Okay. Thanks. Super good meeting. Thank you. Yep. No problem. Bye. See ya, folks. Bye, bye. Bye. Happy Thanksgiving.